Hello there, I'm Jeff Moore. I'm one of the shop captains here at Tinker Mill. And uh, we're, today we're gonna talk about using a saw stop. Uh, what we're going to go through today is just the basic operation. It won't make you an expert, but it should give you a sense of how to run the saw so you can be safe. Saw stop's the safest saw on the market right now. So this one happens to be an industrial tool that's got a 10 inch blade, a five horsepower motor. It's got an industrial quality rip fence that provides precise positioning. What's really unique about the saw stop is that it has a, a, a safety system in it that if you were to make contact with the blade, it automatically slams a aluminum block into the blade and it stops the saw and drops the blade below the table. Hopefully you watched the video and you saw what happens to a hot dog when they touch it with the saw stop. So it's really a good safety feature. However, like any other industrial control, it's not fail safe. So make sure that um, you still respect the saw blade as it runs because it is still a, a tool that uh, is designed to cut wood. It'll cut your finger just as easily. So like I mentioned, it has the ability to sense your finger or conductive materials. Because of that, <clears throat> it precludes the use of certain things like wet wood, gold or silver leaf picture frames, like because the, the metal on the frame is conductive. Metal clad materials like uh, circuit boards, laser cut wood, the carbon at the, where it's cut has been shown to trip the saw stop. Even anything slightly conductive is enough to make it go. Even while the blade is spinning, if you like turn it off and it's spinning down, touching it with anything conductive will trigger the system. So just be aware of what the saw is doing and stay away from the blade until it's completely at a stop. No plastics are allowed to be cut in the wood shop. That's just a general rule and we have to, you know, we just are gonna abide by that. Tinker Mill will only allow use of the saw stop with a safety system engaged. It does have an override system, but don't even ask for the key because we won't give it to you. By agreeing to use this tool, you're responsible for any activation of the, the safety system. Somebody had a bad day here. It's a $150 mistake. So please be careful. Anything metal, anything wet, anything like your finger. The thing about it is though, it's 150 bucks, it saves your finger. That's a, a, cheap, a cheap price to pay compared to going to the emergency room. Report any activation of the safety system to the shop captains. Only shop captains can change the unactivated blade cartridge. We will know who trips it because they'll be logged into the saw through our tinker access node. Prerequisites. You really have to, be, have to have gone through new member orientation and have your key fob because that's what activates the ticker access system. So the, we recommend that you use the guard. This will cover the blade. It has some safety features built into it like these, uh, these um, pawls, they're called pawls, and they will, if you're running your board through and you get a kickback, they will dig into the board and, and kind of hopefully prevent it from kicking back. It also has this solid metal um, support here that keeps the kerf, the kerf is a slot that the saw blade makes, keeps the kerf from closing in and binding on the blade. So to install the uh, blade guard, it goes in place of the um, riving knife. Never cut freehand on the, on the saw. Don't do this. Because this is a, a sure way to make sure that you are going to get kicked back. So what happens is that if you don't get 
you don't get it perfect as, it, as you get through the end of the cut, you get, it's uncontrolled. And at that point, you, if you lose control, it's going to uh, pr probably injure you. Always support your work with the fence, a miter gauge, or a cross-cut sled, or a dedicated jig. The work is always supported in those fashions, and you know, it, it will be safe to operate the saw. So obviously, the, let's talk about the, uh, the table saw terminology. The main table fence, it's cast iron. It's pretty flat, and it works as the main support for the, the, the whole saw operation. Outfeed table, rip fence, table extension. This has a 36 inch wide rip capacity and it's a really nice saw. Other things of note, this is the throat plate. It let, in this case, it lets the riving knife or the blade guard come up through and the saw blade has a slot to run in. And the riving knife, this prevents the um, board you're cutting from closing in on the saw blade and, and getting caught or getting uh, pinched on the blade while it's turning. This is the blade guard. It goes in just like the riving knife and it's recommended that you use it. Insert the throat plate, and as you can see, saw blades encased in plastic now. This is the safest way to run a saw, and we recommend it. There's another feature of this uh, uh, blade guard. If you snap these uh, rods in place, and we're going to lower the blade. If your board is too thick to go, or if the blade isn't up high enough to cut your board, this is going to stop it. If you raise the blade and it runs underneath, you'll, you'll, it'll make sure you have a cut. This is what I was talking about with the poles. They lift up, and if there's a kickback, they're going to hopefully grab the lumber. Dust collection is extremely important. Make sure this port is open before you start up the saw. And make sure you turn on the dust collection before you start up the saw. Mention the miter gauge. This is what you'd use for cross cuts. Cross cuts me being across the grain. Use the rip fence for rips where you would go parallel to the grain. Make sure you have a pretty straight edge. You want a straight edge against the rip fence because if it's not, your board can twist and, and you could lose control of it. So this wheel raises and lowers the blade. It's called the elevation um, crank. So we'll raise the blade up with using that wheel and uh, as you can see the blade goes up and down. The hand wheel on this side bevels the blade. And, they, and this is a left tilt table saw which means the blade tilts to the left as you set an angle. Living on the side of the blade uh, case, there should be a, a magnetic angle gauge that lets you set the angle precisely. This is the main start stop. This is the main power button. And these are the indicator LEDs that tell you the condition of the saw right now. 
So I'll demonstrate that next. I'll log into Tinker Access. So the first thing you would do is turn on the power. You're going to see a blinking red light. That means it's checking out the safety system. The saw won't start until there's a solid light. Solid green means go. While it's blinking, the saw system is active, which means if you touch the blade with anything conductive, it will you know, set off the uh, safety system, which will cost you 150 bucks. So be careful. Wait for the blade to stop. There's no big hurry. Take your time. Remember, a, saw, a, a circular or table saw is really very prone to kickback. If the lumber squeezes in on the blade, if you get the blade twisted or the work twisted a little bit away from the fence, it can grab the, the work and throw it back at you. So with that in mind, don't stand anywhere between these two miter gauge slots. Either stand to the left or stand to the right. That way you're out of the line of fire if there happens to be a kickback. Believe me, that blade's turning 150 miles an hour and that, that your work will come out of there at that speed initially. So if you're standing here, you're gonna have a bad day. So let's set up to do a cut. First of all, adjust the blade height. You open it up to the, gullet, the top of the gullet, uh, the bottom of the gullet. The gullet is the space between the teeth, where there's a little semicircular or uh, elliptical cutout. That's called the gullet. And what that does, it gives a place for the sawdust to accumulate while the blade is in the cut. So you gotta make, the, that would be as high as you'd want it. A quarter of an inch is about as, as low as you'd want it. But set it so you're making sure you're cutting through the board. Examine your material. This one looks pretty good, it's nice and flat. Let's see. Pick the straightest edge. Lower the blade guard. Turn on the dust collection. I'm going to use a push stick to take this through that cut. If you're in here, you don't want your fingers anywhere in this area here. I kind of go by a, a rule of thumb if it's on the red part of the throat plate, use a push stick. And even if you're not, keep three fingers up on top of the rip fence. There's several kinds. You would use this one after you get the board onto the material. So this is, you pick your straightest edge. Dust collection is turned on, or the opening. And I'm standing to the side. You see the blade guard raises up. Push the material past the blade. So I'm going to intentionally create an error. If we take, I've turned the saw off. Let's pull the paddle out. There's an error code for the paddle not, um, for the on off switch to be activated. We'll turn it on. So you got these blinking lights. 
That's a code. So you got a green and red blinking, blinking, blinking. On the side of the control box here, if you look down, you see green and red blinking constantly. It says push, start, stop, paddle to off. So that's how you would try to uh, verify what the error actually is. So the saw's ready to go. Turn on dust collection. We're going to do a cross cut. Pinch the material against the miter gauge and push it through and pull it back. Leave the piece off cut in there until the saw blade stops. Only then would you reach in there to get this. Multiple cuts. It is acceptable to do multiple cuts as long as you don't get too many pieces accumulated. What happens is that if this gets you know, full of little pieces, one of them could get caught on here and throw it back at you. So you could do a couple, two or three, and then you're ready to stop the saw, clean it up. The other thing you don't want to do is use the rip fence in combination with the miter gauge. Well, if you cut this, and as it comes through this edge, there's no, there's no clearance here. This piece is trapped. The saw blade will catch it and throw it out. So do not do this operation in this fashion. In order to do something like this, you would clamp a block to the right, to the fence here. You would clamp a block to the fence and as you move it forward, now there's clearance where it makes the cut. The piece won't get trapped and it won't fly back at you. So that's one way you can use multiple cutoffs. The other way, there are other ways to do it, but uh, that's the simplest. This miter gauge lives here. And we have a second miter gauge a little more precise. Let's you set precision angles down to a half a degree. It goes in the miter slot the same way. And you can see with this type of fence, the blade guard is actually in the way. That, that's a situation where you'd pop this thing up and this will still run under the miter gauge. Okay. I think you're going to find it. Most people don't like use the blade guard. If you choose not to use the blade guard, you're at your own risk. If you choose not to use the blade guard, you must use the riving knife. As I showed you, it just goes in in place of the... I turn the saw off, open the side door, lift up, hang this on the hook on the side of the saw, Install the riving knife, and as you can see, it lines up with the blade and is an aid to help prevent any lumber from twisting.
to a point where it might grab the saw blade. Without it, you could cross over the blade like this and it would get a kickback. And these kickbacks are especially bad because they come out like this. You either have to use this, the, like I say it again, if you choose to use a riving knife, it's your choice, but it's less safe. The other, only time you wouldn't have a riving knife or a blade guard in is if you're making a dado cut. A dado blade is eight inches, and this riving knife is set up for a 10 inch blade so that if you're running a dado, the, the dado slot will uh, clear the blade or the riving knife and it'll get caught halfway into your cut and then you have to do it all again. Other things you want to know about are feather boards. This will be a little easier to see. A feather board keeps your material pressed against the, the, the rip vents. So this one acts by, with magnetic um, locks, sticks it to the table. And you see these fingers are flexible. And this, this aids in pushing the material against the fence. And at the same time, it prevents, it will help slow down kickback because it does drag on the board pretty well. One thing that's nice about it, if you have a really long piece, it helps you guide in, uh, guide your work into the, to the saw blade when you're standing back four or five feet. Keep your hand back here. Push your material past the blade and just let this set there. You don't want it to, uh, uh, you don't want to reach in there and grab it. Be patient. I think when woodworking is really about accomplishing something that's uh, of value to you, and it's not, it's not worth the time to try to rush through things. So just keep that in mind. Featherboard. It's magnetic, it sits, it sticks to the side of the saw table or saw cabinet. So now we're going to do a blade change. What's the first thing you need to do is turn off the, the saw. Then unplug the cord. It disconnects all the power from the saw stop. Keep the cord within reach of you so you know that you're safe. Raise the blade. Makes it easier to access the arbor nut. Remove the blade guard. Open the side door here. Lift this lever and remove the, the revving knife. The two wrenches that hang on the side of the saw, one side on the one on the left, and then pull the right hand towards you to loosen the nut. Remove the nut. Remove the washer. The 
The washer has a bevel on the backside that goes against the blade. This goes against the nut, and you know, it's, um, this side goes against the blade with, with the cutout in the center. The nut rides on this side of the washer. Then the blade will slide off the arbor. Set your blade down on something other than the cast iron table well, because the, the cast iron table could get could damage or you could chip one of the carbide teeth. <clears throat> Reverse the procedure. Blade, washer, nut, When you go to tighten this thing, it's not a matter of uh, who has the most strength. It's a matter of making sure it's snug. The nut will self-tighten. I find this nut over-tightened almost every time I come in and change the blade. So just realize <clears throat> it doesn't take superhuman strength to tighten the arbor nut. Make sure it's nice and snug and everybody will be fine. Replace the riving knife or the blade guard, whichever you're choosing to use. Install the throat plate. Make sure it's flush with the table, not sticking up. And then lower the blade back down. Plug the saw back in. There are there's two black marks. If you line them up, that'll help you Get the cord back together. The twist lock, just lock it in place. It takes a, a minute or so for the tinker access to boot up. Okay, and then you turn on the main power. And you should be back in business. So one other thing I want to point out is that this uh, machine is on a mobile base. You can pump up the hydraulic, I think it's hydraulic. You raise it here, you lower it here. Pretty, pretty straightforward. You need to fold down the outfeed out table in order to move it. This will allow you to move it to another location. So if you need to make room for behind or in front of you, you can do that that way. Just make sure you lower it back down to the floor and you're ready to go again. Okay, now we're going to set up the dado stack. The dado um, is a slot that you would put in a piece of wood where you could insert another piece of wood into the slot. Uh, they also make a good tool to make rabbits. A rabbit would be like a piece of plywood in the back of a cabinet. So it's more of an L shape. This is the rabbit. And this is the dado. So Tinker Mill has two dado sets in the back on the shelf. And the way a dado stack works is that you have two saw blades an inner and an outer saw blade. So when you have just the two blades, it makes a quarter inch wide groove for a dado. In order to make a wider dado, you can insert a, a different variety of chippers. Chippers are the, the part of the saw blade that, that 
knocks out the material that's in between the two outer blades. So the way this works is that you have your blade on the saw, this side out, which means outside of the dado. So one blade there, you insert a chipper, you insert a second chipper, and you stack these up until you get to the, to the right required groove that you want. And then you put on the other blade. So now we have a, a wide blade. You have uh, different sets of chippers. And there's a chart in the box that kind of walks you through what chippers go where. There are two widths. One of them, there's one one sixteenth of an inch chipper. One sixteenth and one eighth. There's three of the one eighths. There's actually more in the back in the other box if you need them. Now to fine tune the width of your dado, you can insert a variety of shims in between the, the chippers. And what that does then is it uh, gives you a precise um, width on your, on your dado. We only have a couple washers here, but I've found it over the years that playing cards actually make good spacers because they're dense and they're, they're coated with plastic and they will, hand, they will handle the pressure. Now in order to use the dado set in the saw stop, we need to put in a different brake cartridge, which you know gets you back into changing the saw blade. This is one step for more than that, in that you have to change the um, cartridge as well, the brake cartridge. So we're going to start off by unplugging the saw, remove all the power from the machine, keep the cord where you know it's safe, remove the throat plate, raise the, raise the saw blade all the way up. Remove, open the side door, remove the right of, riving knife, and take out the blade as is demonstrated earlier. The arbor nut and the washer. This side of the washer goes against the blade. The bevel on this side of the washer goes away from the blade and the nut goes here. I'm going to remove the blade and put it in a safe place. So prior to putting the, the dado stack on, you need to change the brake cartridge. Okay. Try to give you a close-up of what take, taking the brake cartridge looks like. First of all, you rotate the red lever up, slide the key out, take the brake cartridge off the pins, install the new brake cartridge. Reinstall the key. Remember, it should be pointing up towards you. And then rotate it down until it locks. And that's all there is to that. Uh, 
This is demonstrated earlier in the video. The different radius on the brake cartridge so it's, it'll stop the saw. Uh, you won't be able to use this cartridge with the data set because it won't, the safety system won't figure out that you've got a, um, a brake cartridge in there. Insert the key. Okay. Now, remember two blades makes a quarter of an inch. And make sure that the teeth point towards you. That when you push the material through the cut, it'll actually cut. Uh, so I'm going to put in a 1 16th and a 1 8 inch chipper. The carbide on the chippers is wider than the body of the chipper. And that's because they will overlap <coughs> each other so that they make a continuous clean cut. They make a nice flat bottom dado. When you, when you uh, place them on the arbor, make sure that the tooth on the chipper goes in the gullet of the blade. That gets back to the, I was saying that the width of the carbide is wider than the width of the body of the chipper. So this is the outside blade. And here again, rotate it so that the chipper's between, in the gullet of the, uh, the chipper. The chipper's in the gullet of the blade. Now, if you put um, a full stack on the arbor, you may not be able to use the washer. You just have to use the nut. Double check, make sure your uh, ch chipper carbides are in the gullet. And snug it up. Close the side door, lower the handle here so it's out of the way. And we're going to put in a different throat plate. You notice this throat plate doesn't have the slots in it for the riving knife so that uh, you won't, re don't, won't try to put it in there. And it gives you, a fur, you know, more support out here. Remember, this is the only time you can use a saw without a riving knife or a blade guard. You have, must have it in there for any of the other operations on the saw. I'm going to lower it down. Plug it back in. Remember the two black marks help you line up the cord and then give it a little twist. So I guess the next step would be set the depth of your dado. I'm just going to set an arbitrary depth. To be most of the time, you're going to need to make maybe a couple of test cuts to get to fine tune the depth of your dado. Since uh, this isn't a real project, I'm not going to worry about that. Go get a push block 
Make sure your dust collection port is open. I'm going to log in to Tinker Access. Turn on the switch. It's going through his blade check now. All right, green light, go. Make sure the dust port is open. Adjust your, or set your blade height first. I'm just guessing. A lot of times you're gonna have to make test cuts to actually dial in your depth of your uh, dado. So I'm gonna put a dado at an inch and a half from the edge. Okay. Dust collection. Makes a nice, neat, flat bottomed slot. Now you can also use the data blade to make a, a, a rabbit. If you attach the uh, auxiliary fence, it just clamps to the main fence. And I'm going to try to use something that's already been done. You're going to want to start the blade down low enough that you're going to be able to get over the auxiliary fence. I'm tighten up these clamps a little bit. So you only have part of the data stack showing. So when I feed this through, it's still going to take out the corner of the board. I'm going to raise it up once I get going here. Turn on the dust collection. Nice little dado. So that's the basics of the dado stack. So now I'm going to switch back to the uh, standard blade. Always switch the dado stack back to the standard blade when you're done. That way it's ready for the next person. Okay. Power off. I should uh, turn off that switch too. <clears throat> You raise the blade so that you can uh, access the arbor nut easier. Open the side door, get ready for the...
and then you put the data stack away back in the box this and then uh, this goes back in the back closet where you found it and now we change the the uh, saw stop brake It goes with that. Insert the key. Lock it in place. And put the blade back on. Washer nut. Okay. I found it with a riving knife in place. So you either have to put the riving knife in or the blade guard. I've mentioned several times before, we recommend you use the blade guard. It would almost totally eliminate any activation of the saw stop system with your body, like fingers or toes or whatever. Close the door. This all goes back in the closet. And then the throat plate goes in, make sure it's flat to the table, and you're set up. Leave the saw with the rip fence over the blade. We're gonna power this back be a pet boy back up. And while that's going on, take this back. So I mentioned earlier in the video that uh, anytime you're cutting your work, it needs to be fully supported, at least on one edge. So that's where this crosscut slide comes in handy. There's a couple of things for you. As you push it through the saw blade, it, it forms a square corner here. So if I were to want to cut that off, it gives me a chance to uh, have a wider surface area to hold it. Now, the other thing it could do for you is that you can um, clamp a stop to one side and you push your material over to the stop and make a cut and then pull your piece off, slide it over, make a cut, pull your piece over so you can make repetitive same length cuts.
So the other thing this does for you is it gives you quite a bit more uh, length, width, I guess you'd say. Like if you have to cut off some plywood shelves, this is a good tool to do that with because it does provide support and off of the table more. So it basically is the table extension in this case. Whereas if you use a miter gauge, you might get 10 inches. This is gonna give you more like 16. You have to just double check your work though before you go by my measurements. I didn't actually measure it. You do lose some blade height because you've got this half inch plywood base. So that's one kind of sled. You can also make different kinds of jigs. This is a box joint jig. So a box joint are square notches in the end of a board that interlock so that you end up making, it's good for making boxes. I'm sure you've probably seen like old cigar boxes were made with box joints. So the same thing, this one's actually missing the runners, but it's got a place for either a single blade for a narrow one or a dado stack to make like quarter inch wide slots. And then it's got an indexing pin so that you can make your slot, index over, make your another slot, index over. And so you can make a box joint with a jig like this. Jigs aren't relegated to only working on the table. Utilize the rip fence to make specialized jigs like this one. If you clamp your uh, styles or rails to this uh, jig, you can actually make uh, nice tenons. If you cut it one side and flip it around and cut the other side, your tenon is going to be perfectly centered in your, in your stock. This is just a sampling of what we have in the back room. You can also go online and find plans for all kinds of different kinds of uh, jigs and fixtures to help you run your saw. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you enjoy the saw. Thank you very much for watching this video. I look forward to meeting you.